I admit that my life has probably been a bit strange by most standards. It's been largely a monastic journey of deep spiritual practice. I have lived a significant portion of my adult life as a Christian contemplative monk, first in the Trappist order in my early 20s and 30s, and then in a French Benedictine style community while in my 40s and early 50s. In between these times of living in Christian monastic communities, I even did a year-long temporary monastic ordination in the Theravadan Buddhist tradition while living in a secluded Buddhist forest monastery in the hills of West Virginia in the mid-90s. This all entailed not only living a daily monastic life, but also many intensive silent meditation retreats over many years. This life of mine has certainly been a very different kind of journey in life than most people take, but I have no regrets. For me it was perfect, and seems to have prepared me for the life I live now, traveling around and sharing spiritual insights and inspiration with others. I think it was kind of simple just one day. It seemed like it was no longer really necessary to have the form. And I felt that there was something for me to do outside of the monastic context somehow. I didn't know precisely what, but it just felt like it was time to leave, you could say. When I came back out, I wasn't affiliated with the church. So in order to be hired on as a staff chaplain, you need church affiliation. Since I didn't have it, that was very difficult to find a job as a chaplain. So the sense I had was that I could utilize my chaplaincy skills, my pastoral skills I developed in that training and work, and it didn't work out for different reasons. Then I got a job as a marketing director of a home health agency and worked at that. I started getting asked to do retreats and teachings and go do talks and things, and it just gradually grew to a point that it, it seemed like it would be better to quit the regular job and do the teaching. And today we're going to be talking about compassionate service. And then the practice of surrender, which is an intentional turning toward and dwelling as and in this deep place of presence in our hearts in the midst of difficult situations. And then as part of surrender, the skillful action that arises out of that ground of acceptance, of allowance, of even loving when it is. Comes the response, the action, the committed action of service. Sometimes it's hard to find a service that suits your personality or that suits your abilities or maybe even your health. But living the surrendered life just naturally gives rise to some form of response to pain, to suffering, to need that we see in the world, in others, even in ourselves. And there are just endless creative ways that can express itself. It's often quite fascinating to see people's response that comes out of this ground of surrender. So the Buddha is basically saying that everything is impermanent. Everything is ultimately not satisfying because it ends. And everything is sort of unstable. It, there's no solid kind of unchanging thing about any phys physical, material, phenomenal reality or object. So therefore, it's dukkha. It's prone to not being ultimately satisfying. So look at the experience of Jesus. He was a person 
that tried to do what was right, tried to live his life in a good way to help others and so on. And in the end, he was killed. He died a kind of criminal execution style death. And like I say, I used to think of that in terms of a kind of redemptive suffering, that somehow or other our suffering was taken on. And, and who knows, you know, there could be some truth to that. There could be. You know, it's a mystery. It's kind of strange. But I think that the primary teaching of the life and death and suffering and, and, and burial of Jesus is about this idea that we enter into our humanity deeply and somehow through that there's a transcendent reality that's revealed to us and revealed through our lives. So it's ultimately a teaching on surrender. But it's a teaching on surrender that's not just given in words. It's not just a spoken teaching, but it's a teaching that's given with a, with a life. You know, if you read the whole account of the suffering and death of Jesus, you see a lot of surrender in it from the beginning to the end. You know, when he's in the garden and he knows his time is up and he knows they're coming to get him and he's having a struggle, he's saying, you know, Father... If it's possible, take this cup from me. Take this suffering from me. But if it's not possible, then not my will, but your will be done. So it's surrender. There's a surrender there. There's a kind of willingness to be with what is, even when what is is not something I particularly like. You know? And we've all had that experience of not wanting to be with what is, of not liking what's on our plate, you know, either literally or figuratively. But there's an interesting sort of discovery that we make that when we can be just simply with what is, with an attitude of surrender, it puts us in touch with an aspect of consciousness that's deeper than our ordinary personal filter that we normally perceive life through. There is an essence to who we are that has nothing to do much with our physical being. It's on a different level. And it's content, it's a kind of innate contentment within us. Some people might call it awareness, or presence, or just simply consciousness. I think my teaching is really taken from my life experience and my own spiritual path. And it's basically what I've come to see is that it is absolutely necessary to come to some sense of awakening up and out of our, just merely our human experience, that there's something transcendent about the human experience that we can discover. And there's this dimension of spirit that is the deepest identity of all of us, and we need to awaken to that. But then I think there's a return movement that, that goes down and into our human experience and really informs it with this, this vision, this view, this absolute view of the transcendent. We have to somehow find a way to live that in our ordinary lives. Recall the fact that you were born a little baby. Picture yourself as that little baby, born into the world, vulnerable, needing help, really entirely dependent upon your parents. And then you grew up little by little. And as you grew and you had different experiences, you had many joys and you had many sorrows. You had many loves and many hates had a lot of ups and downs, and yet through it all, there was one deep desire in your heart, and that was the desire to find happiness, to find peace. So life as a human being is wonderful and beautiful and difficult at times. Just call to mind all those wonderful things and all those difficult things, and feel some sense of loving kindness or compassion for yourself. Feel the natural sense. 
I think meditation practice is really essential and really important. And most people, probably on the level of linear time, need to meditate for a while in order to come to some clarity about reality. But my own sense is that really surrender in ordinary life situations is really the primary practice. A meditation seems to me to be intentionally turning toward this kind of consciousness or presence or awareness that's simply present to whatever comes, to whatever goes. It doesn't grab on, it doesn't push away. It's simply present. And I think doing that in the context of a quiet room on a cushion is meditation. Doing that in the midst of a traffic jam or when somebody's yelling at you or when you're in some difficulty in life is surrender. And formulate that wish for happiness for yourself into some phrases that you can repeat after me as you say, may I be well. May I be well. May I be happy. May I be happy. May I be at peace. May I be at peace. Don't just mechanically say the words. Try to feel the sense of wishing well to yourself as you say these phrases. Try to find that place in your heart that longs for happiness. Now I want you to call to mind a person in your life who is very easy for you to love. It may be a small child, a baby, it may be an elderly person, someone who you deeply appreciate in your life. And again, don't just mechanically repeat the phrases. Really feel in your heart the energy of wishing them well. And I want you to call to mind a neutral person someone who shows up in your life on some regular basis but you don't feel especially strong feelings toward them either positively or negatively but they are just like you they are just like your loved one they are a human being they were born they grew up they experienced difficulties joys and sorrows They've probably experienced great love and they've probably experienced fear. All the things that you've experienced, they've experienced. Just like you, they desire happiness. The happiness that you wish for yourself is the same happiness you wish for them. Some of the um, teaching from um, Eastern, like Buddhist thinking, came together with um, sort of sort of Christian, but it wasn't overtly Christian, and it just sort of happened really naturally, and it was just really direct and practical. Mm. And I just felt really enthusiastic afterwards when I went home. That's great. I think what's drawn me to come and spend the time here with Francis this weekend is he communicates with an awful lot of compassion and a lot of heart in what he's saying and in particular I'm very drawn to his teaching that there is contemplation and um, an experience of oneness if you like or an experience of what some teachers call you know no self but then that there's an integration in that that it's not negating the, the individual self it's not throwing that away but that, that it is expressing itself as that so that that sense of integration and the sense of oneness if you like acting in the world as us is a sort of healing again then of welcoming the personal individual self and that's particularly what I like about what he's sharing. The embodiment of the teaching and the, the living of the teaching um, whereas uh, there's a lot of teachers um, coming from a transcendent point of view and perspective um, so it's so uh, beautiful to hear and experience and um, to really challenge myself um, to actually live and embody the teachings. Living an awakened life is about awakening to all aspects of life. You know, I think we need to awaken on many different levels. And awakening on the level of the heart, I think, is really central and important. And it's important in how I teach and what I share. So I think an element of devotion in the spiritual life somehow rounds it out 
and puts it on that level of the heart. And uh, I think as human beings, we need that level. Um, we need to have an awakened heart. The practice of service, compassionate service in the world, is a heart-opening practice. Some of us, even on a spiritual journey, can become extremely narcissistic focused on ourselves alone. But is that really what spirituality is all about? Me, me, me? There's an element, I'm included, but what about all these other folks? So service helps us step out of that tendency, that ego, ego-centered tendency of narcissism. So we can reach out, we can serve, we can look around our world and see what the needs are. I've talked to a lot of homeless people over the years and the theme that seems to come up again and again that they mention that is probably the hardest thing for them is to be ignored, to not be acknowledged as a human being. If you ever watch homeless people sitting on the street, you might notice some of them look searchingly at everybody that goes by because they're looking for that acknowledgement. And often it's met just with a cold stare, or it's not even met at all. So one form of service that we can all do, if we live in a place where we regularly see homeless people, is to simply acknowledge their humanity, that they're a human being. But I would never tell anybody how to serve. I would tell you to look in your own heart, look in your own world, find what touches that heart, and then respond how you feel inspired to respond. So that's starting on an ordinary relative human level. And a lot of good and a lot of wonderful, beautiful acts of kindness can flow from that alone. But if we practice that enough, it begins to open our heart more and more. And we come to a deeper understanding of our heart's core. Yeah, for me, Christianity and Buddhism together really informed my spiritual journey. And I see the models of Jesus and Buddha as being really complementary models in my life. It wasn't really just Jesus being the model of awakening for me, but 
Jesus and Buddha together, they both, I think, point to different aspects of awakening very well, that I needed both those aspects. So for me, the Buddha points to the transcendent awakening up and out of the mere humanity. Uh, Jesus, for me, is a good symbol and points to the reality of the return movement of awakening that enters back into the human condition fully and embraces it and brings the wisdom of the absolute into the ordinary daily life of humanity. And also the weaker sort of aspects of what it means to be a human being, the, the finite quality of it, the vulnerability of it, human fallibility, that that's part of all of our experiences, no matter how enlightened or awakened we are. On another level, we remain human beings. And I think that grounds us in a kind of humility that can often be lacking when there's just a kind of focus on the transcendent. I still consider myself a Christian. My theology is probably not terribly traditional in some ways. My sense of Jesus now is that Jesus was an awakened person who really awakened to the reality of being the Son of God, of being divine. But my sense is that his message, more along the lines that we're all divine, that we're all the Son of God or daughter of God, and that we need to realize that for ourselves. So the idea of holding Jesus as some kind of um, exclusive divine being, I don't think I would do that anymore, but I, I, I see him as pointing to the divinity that's innate in every human being. Dear Jesus, help me to spread your fragrance everywhere I go. Flood my soul with your spirit and life. Penetrate and possess my whole being so utterly that every soul I come in contact with may feel your presence in my soul. Let them look up and see no longer me, but only Jesus. Stay with me, then I shall begin to shine as you shine so to shine as to be a light to others. The light, O oh Jesus, will be all from you. None of it will be mine. It will be you shining on others through me. Let me thus praise you in the way you love best by shining on those around me. Let me preach you without preaching, not by words, but by my example, by the catching force by the sympathetic influence of all that I do, by the evident fullness of the love my heart bears. Amen. And we need to look at our denial of death. When people die, we send them to a person who prepares them, dresses them up like they're going to a party, and we gather around them and say, oh, they look so wonderful. They're dead. <laughs> They've looked better. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Let's just be honest here. No matter how much makeup, no matter how many fancy clothes you put on a corpse, a corpse is still a corpse. May have makeup on, may have better color. They put lights on it to make it look better. But it's a dead body. In some cultures, they don't do that. They don't cover over death. In India, you can go to charnel grounds and see where people are burned, and there's dead bodies anywhere to be seen. They're not looking like they're going to a party. They look like dead bodies. And people are a little more in touch with that reality. Some people can look at this kind of a comment and think, oh, that's depressing, that's, you know, that's negative. No, it's real. <laughs> if we get to be born, we get to get sick and we get to get old, if we live long enough, and we get to die. And we all know that. We all, we try to run from that, we try to deny it, but we all have those basic experiences, don't we? no matter how much we might try to avoid them. Everybody in this room has been sick, at least to some degree, some seriously sick. And it reminds us of our vulnerability, of our mortality, of the fleeting quality of human life. Some people find serious illness to have been one of their greatest gifts because it helps them to see 
that life is short. It's important to be committed to certain values, to the value of love, to the value of kindness and care for others. And when people are told they're going to die, a lot of times that really focuses them, helps them to see what's important, what they need to, to look at, what they need to focus on. If you ever just stand in front of a tree and, and just look at it and feel its energy, it seems to me to be radiating this sense of beingness in a way that's very extraordinary and really as powerful as any guru anywhere on the planet. Um, I don't know, my sense is that just the natural world in so many ways can kind of teach us how to just rest as being, to rest as presence, because that's what it's constantly doing, very unselfconsciously. But I think if we pay attention, all of these things can just speak to us deeply of who we are on the deepest level. So when we look around the world and we see all these people and we see all these animals and we even see trees and nature, and we understand that the processes that we go through of birth, old age, sickness and death, all these forms go through as well, just like us. So we have a sense of solidarity with them. We have a sense just naturally, before any kind of an awakening, just on a natural human level, we have that sense that yes, we're all in the same boat here. I think a lot of human beings have that conditioned tendency to almost look at nature as something outside of us, that's separate from us, that we utilize, that we exploit for various reasons, natural resources. But I think if we're ever to, to allow the earth to even continue, I think at this point, we have to recognize that we're not separate from nature. It's not some separate entity that's sort of offering us things we can take and use. But that it's really part of us and we're part of it. We need to take every opportunity we have to be in nature, to commune with nature, to really understand that it's, 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 it's giving us an eloquent sermon just by its very existence, by its very being. So everything that is, is somehow filled with love, filled with the love of God, filled with the love of presence. In this whole journey toward clarity, toward awakening, is all about learning to live as being itself. Learning to understand that this God that is our being, is in everything. Most high, all-powerful, good Lord, yours are the praises, the glory, and the honor, and all blessing. To you alone, most high, do they belong. No human is worthy to mention your name. Praise be you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Son, who is the day and through whom you give us light. And he is beautiful and radiant with great splendor and bears a likeness to you, Most High. Praise be you, my Lord, through sister moon and stars. In heaven you form them clear and precious and beautiful. Praise be you, my Lord, through brother wind and through the air, cloudy and serene in every kind of weather, through whom you give sustenance to your creatures. Praise be you, my Lord, through Sister Water, who is very useful and humble and precious and chaste. Praise be you, my Lord, through Brother Fire, through whom you light the night, and he is beautiful and playful, robust and strong. Praise be you, my Lord, through our sister Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us, and who produces various fruit with colored flowers and herbs. Praise be you, my Lord, through those who give pardon for your love and bear infirmity and tribulation. Blessed are those who endure in peace, for by you, Most High, shall they be crowned. Praise be you, my Lord, through our sister bodily death, from whom no one living can escape. 
Woe to those who die in mortal sin. Blessed are those whom death will find in your most holy will, for the second death shall do them no harm. Praise and bless my Lord, and give him thanks, and serve him with great humility. <laughs>